According to three separate studies on three continents, every year between seven and eight million people die from fossil fuel burning, mostly from air pollution and the effects of climate change. The technology's there. Let's engineer our way through this climate crisis that we're in right now. Hi, I'm Bob McDonald. I'm the host of Quirks and Quarks on CBC Radio and the author of The Future is Now, Solving the Climate Crisis with Current Technology. Well, Bob, thanks so much for, for joining me and taking the time to speak uh, with, with me and the futureeconomy.ca audience today. Um, I want to speak about your book, the book you just mentioned. Uh, as you said, it's called The Future is Now, Solving the Climate Crisis with Current Technology. Uh, and in it, you talk about how the technologies that are necessary for us to produce energy uh, without carbon emissions and to green our societies already exist. Uh, so I want to dive into that and ask you, first of all, what are these technologies that you're most optimistic about? And what are the economic or societal opportunities that their mass adoption and implementation represents, both globally, but also for us as Canadians specifically? Well, Tim, that was one of the great joys when I started researching this book, is that there are no new inventions needed to go green. Uh, first of all, there's no shortage of energy either. There, there's more energy falling out of the sky every hour than we use in a year. We just need to gather that up. Our country is so large, so you get different technologies for different areas. In the prairies, uh, you're going to get wind and solar because there's lots of it out there. Um, in the Maritimes, you're going to get tidal energy. They're, re they're working on it in the Bay of Fundy, the highest tides in the world. They're researching tidal energy there. The same thing here on the West Coast where I live, where tides squeeze between islands and, and it speeds up and you get really strong currents out here. Uh, geothermal. That's more of a mountain thing because the magma has to come close to the surface up through extinct volcanoes. So that's the mountains of the West. Wind technology has changed because uh, of the ability to build really large wind turbines. And in both wind and solar, size matters because the energy is spread out over large areas. And the largest windmill in the world now, called, at the time of writing my book, was called the Halyard X, General, General Electric. They have one in uh, Denmark. And it is two and a half times taller than our peace tower on the parliament buildings in Ottawa. It's it's taller than the Saturn V moon rocket, 260 meters. And this thing can power 16,000 homes. One, one turbine can do that. Um, the These things are so large, uh, a single turn of the blade can power a house for two days. That's That's astounding. They're so big now so that you don't need huge fields of turbines. People say, oh, they're really ugly. And they're going to put them offshore. Europe is doing this. You, you put them out on the ocean where the winds are strong and consistent. And we can do that as well. So one of the big criticisms of alternatives is that the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine, which is true. So you have to store energy for when those technologies are not functioning. Hydrogen is one way to do that. And we have a company in Saskatchewan that has found a way to get hydrogen out of oil while the oil is still in the ground. While the oil is still in the ground, they can just get the hydrogen up. And uh, so that's kind of cool. They can do that. There are different ways of storing energy besides batteries. Um, there's one called gravitricity. They use gravity. They just haul up these giant blocks of concrete and they make a huge, huge tower when there's energy available. And then when you need energy, they pick up these blocks with big cranes and they just let them fall slowly to the ground. And as they're coming down at the top of the crane on the cable, there's a pulley and it spins around and it runs a generator. So you're using gravity to store energy. And you got five of these cranes. So one of them's, one of them's always working. There's a company in Ontario that's storing energy with compressed air. They have an abandoned mine that they just pump air into and get it up to really high pressure. It's a large volume, really high pressure, and then just hold it like a balloon that's been blown up. And then when you need the energy back, you let the air come shooting out through a small orifice. And again, there's a turbine that spins a generator. Air, you're storing it in air. And that's the future. Energy is going to come from a lot of different sources be depending on where you live. Um, we're going to rethink nuclear. Canada has a great history of nuclear power. Uh, our reactors, the CANDU reactors, have a, a really good safety record, but they're expensive. They're big and they're multi-billion dollar projects that take years to build and, and millions to maintain every year. 
Well, Canada's now investing in small modular nuclear reactors with a core that's only about the size of an office desk, and you bury it underground, and it'll power a small town. So in the north, we could have uh, small modular reactors running towns that are now being powered by diesel generators. So uh, with our vast geography, we're going to have different sources of energy everywhere, including your own house. You'll be producing power yourself as well. From an economic point of view, that's jobs. Right. That's, that's a lot of jobs there to install that stuff, to maintain that stuff, to serve to, to whatever. So I, it's, it's there, you know, it's just there. And it's been a little frustrating for me to know that all that stuff's out there, but we're just not using it. I, I think of it like being on the Titanic. You know, we've hit the iceberg. The ship's going down. There are lots of ice of lifeboats and they say, okay, get in the lifeboats. And then people start saying, I don't know. Are those things recyclable? Where did the materials come to build those boats? What what happens after they're used? I don't like the color. I'm staying on the ship, you know. <laughs> and so the, the the arguments against the the alternatives that I hear just don't add up. They just don't add up. When you think about what we've been doing so far to the planet, you know, uh, yeah, get on with it. All right, <laughs> let's just get on with it. So that's the next challenge. That's a big challenge, I think. Um, how do we get to put that to work? So. What do you see then as sort of the forces or the trends or the challenges that are holding us back from accelerating the adoption and the implementation of those technologies in Canada? Right. There, there are a couple. I think one is fear. Uh, it's a soft barrier. There's fear. There's fear that, well, it's going to be too expensive. Uh, there's, there's fear on the public part that, uh, well, how do I know it really works? And is it going to cost me too much? There's fear from industry that some industries that, gee, this is going to put us out of business. Uh, there's fear from uh, politicians that we're going to lose votes. Uh, you know, we're going to be unpopular if we do that. Those fears can be overcome. And we saw an example of how you can get four elements to work together, science, technology, the government and the public. And we did that during COVID. Industry stepped in, the pharmaceutical companies developed billions of doses to spread them around. Then the government stepped in and said, okay, we're going to support that. We're going to support the industry, the science, and we're going to say if we're going to, the science said shut down, you know, everybody's got to stay still because it's airborne. And so we put out those mandates. They did that. <clears throat> they also supported people who lost their jobs, industries that were affected, and the public bought into it. We started wearing masks and doing all of those things. So the four elements, the four elements, the science, the industry, the government, and the public, we all got together and we flattened the curve of coronavirus. Well, now we need to flatten the curve of climate change. The science has been saying, look, it's there. It's, it's rising. We know that the government's slow. They're doing things, but it's slow. And then the public is doubtful, partly because of campaigns to put doubt in the minds of, uh, of the public and uh, the oil industry or the fossil fuel industry feels threatened. But that doesn't need to be the case. It, it, we can move forward if we do what we did with COVID and cooperate rather than polarize it and make enemies, you know, say, Oh, bad, bad oil industry. Oh, good tree huggers. Don't do that. No, no, no. Let's, let's find other ways to get energy out of oil. So I, I believe we can do it. Hopefully it just won't come to as much of an emergency as COVID was with people dying so much every, uh, every year. I want to ask from a policy perspective, uh, or from a, a leadership perspective, what do you think is needed on that front uh, in order to yeah, get us over this hump and push us forward? Well, you can do two things. Uh, one is to support the uh, the new technology, support research. Uh, governments can afford to take chances on new technologies that uh, private industry can't. So the, invest, invest in the new ideas. Uh, for example, in solar, there are new materials called perovskites, which are these uh, very, very thin film materials. You can actually see through them, which seems odd. You, you want to capture sunlight, but you have something that sunlight can go through, but they're still photovoltaic and you can coat windows with them. And you think about all the windows that we have in our tall buildings in our cities. If you coat those with perovskite film, they become solar. They're talking about perovskite paints. Well, all you have to do is paint your house and it'll get, it'll become solar. Well, that stuff is in development. We need, we need, we need work. We need research to support that. The government can also make, although they're unpopular, they can make mandates. And you look at what California's doing. California's talking about banning the sale of combustion engine cars 
in in the future. They they want to have all cars electric. So then you have an incentive there. You say, okay, we're going to mandate that this new technology that's really good is is going to become popular and get rid of the the old one. So it's again, it's an evolution. We'll still have cars. There'll just be something different under the hood turning the wheels instead of this hundred and fifty year old inefficient combustion engine that pollutes the atmosphere to an electric motor that's either driven by a battery or maybe a hydrogen fuel cell. So we can do that. Again, evolve the technology like we evolved the phone. In the book, you address the topic of oil and you say that we have to rethink the way we use it. So I want to know what role you think the oil and gas sector has to play in the sort of clean tech and energy transition conversation uh, and also where you see them fitting in at all, if at all, in uh, Canada's future economy. The oil companies, it would be in their best interest to invest in clean energy so that they're providing us energy. And uh, uh, one interesting example is Iceland. It's a volcanic island, the whole the whole island, and they have a huge geothermal resource there. So they generate their electricity, some of it, with geothermal energy, which is clean and reliable and cheap. And they wanted to go to a hydrogen economy using the electricity to break down water, which is hydrogen and oxygen, into hydrogen and oxygen, and then go to a hydrogen economy because they don't have any oil of their own. They have to import it all, which is very expensive. So they were planning to uh, do all of this. They're still working on it a little bit. Who was helping them with the distribution of the hydrogen? Because it has to go to a service station and so people can fill up their fuel cell cars. Dutch Shell. Shell oil was helping a country get off oil. And the philosophy, this was back in the 90s, was that we don't care what cars fill up with when they go to a station, as long as it says Shell. <laughs> so that's very smart. And that's that's the idea, is make them energy companies. And this is a challenge that I would like to send out to any young engineers that are watching this program. Is there another way to get energy out of oil besides just taking the hydrogen out of it? We already know how to do that. Most hydrogen today comes from natural gas. We can also get it from oil and, and coal. It's harder and dirtier, but we, we already know how to do that. But the oil contains tremendous amounts of energy. So how else can we extract the energy from oil and not have those leftover byproducts? There's a challenge. Let's do that. So we're not going to throw oil away. We're not. It's too, it's too dense. Well, I love the fact that you threw out that challenge to to young engineers out there listening. Um, I want to go. I want to continue in that vein and ask you what your very quick, very uh, punchy calls to action would be uh, to to the following stakeholder groups in terms of accelerating the innovation and adoption uh, of the clean technologies that you you listed throughout this interview. Um, firstly, it would be our governments. What do Canadian governments need to do now? Uh, to, to make this happen quicker? Well, the Canadian government can live up to its mandates to reduce carbon emissions. They can support uh, new research and uh, new technologies, not just in our universities, but uh, give tax breaks or <clears throat> incentives to industries that are trying to develop these, make it easy for the public to invest in this. If they're thinking about putting solar panels or whatever on the roof, uh, there are grants available. Keep that there. <clears throat> and to Tax carbon, tax carbon. Uh, we already do tax carbon, but uh, keep that up and invest that carbon tax directly back into the clean technology, not just into the central pot. There's so many things we can do, but think positively. And I want to leave you with uh, with a scary statistic that I found out when doing the book. Um, during the two years of COVID, roughly five and a half million people lost their lives. And that's a terrible tragedy. But we beat COVID. We're still fighting it with that four elements that I talked about, the science, the technology, the government, and the public. We all got together. But five and a half million people died. According to three separate studies on three continents, every year, between seven and eight million people die from fossil fuel burning, mostly from air pollution and the effects of climate change. Seven to eight million people a year. That's twice as many as died from COVID. And we just let that go. So it's not just a climate issue. It's a human health issue. It's a survival issue. We've got to face this fact, not get scared by it, not become fatalistic about it, not give up, not become fearful, but move ahead. The technology's there. Let's engineer our way through this climate crisis that we're in right now. We're smart. 
We went to the moon for God's sakes. We're really innovative. So let's just get on with it now. I believe we can do that. And I'm actually optimistic. I believe in human ingenuity. As a Canadian who grew up listening to you, dissecting all that science and all the power and potential it represents, thank you. Thank you for being so passionate about it and sharing, sharing that passion with us. It's been my pleasure, Tim. Thanks for having me. Bob McDonald's uh, book is The Future Is Now. Go check it out. And Bob, thank you so much. I really appreciate it.